United States Trade Representative, and boy, what a complicated job at a complicated time for free trade. It seems that um, both the left and the right in politics in the United States are making it difficult to negotiate trade deals. She is doing her best. She has just been out at APEC doing a great job for the country with many, many meetings. And to interview her, we have David Weston uh, from Bloomberg. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anya, for that introduction. And thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, for doing this. Thank you so much. everybody wants to hear from you. Well, I'm uh, looking forward to this. <laughs> so am I. Uh, so in thinking about this, and thinking about your job, it struck me you have uh, a multi-layer job. Hmm. Uh, you cover the globe, mm -hmm. literally. Yes. But you also cover a lot of different aspects. I mean, some of us might think about trade as economics, which it is. Absolutely. But it also covers geopolitics, which is what this organization is really devoted to. It covers climate. Yeah. It covers the role of workers, a lot of different yes. things. So let me ask you one specific question that touches on the globe mm -hmm. and a lot of different aspects, and that is data and the WTO. <laughs> uh, you changed a policy this mm -hmm. fall, mm -hmm. uh, I think 30 years plus policy, mm -hmm. favoring when it comes to data flow across borders mm -hmm. as well as location. Mm -hmm. You changed the policy, said you were saying, why did you do that? Okay, let me take two steps back and just engage with the way you set up the conversation because I think it's so important to reinforce this. Um, when you say that you're the United States trade representative and um, uh, you're abroad, I think people will say, oh, well, you know, we have a commerce minister, a foreign minister, a trade minister, or something like that. When you say you're the U.S. trade representative here at home, and I do as much, I try to do as much domestic travel as I do foreign travel, you often just get um, blank looks. Like, <laughs> uh, what is the U.S. trade representative? And I think that um, that's such an important part of the conversation because, to your point, uh, we sit at the intersection of some very, very powerful forces. Uh, one of them is that we are absolutely a part of the foreign policy team. You're right. You have to do trade with others, other countries, other economies. So we're, we're part of the foreign policy tool set. But at the same time, trade absolutely is about economics and what you, the decisions that you make in your international economic policy impacts your domestic economy. So we are equally a part of the domestic economic policy team and we sit at that intersection and it's an uncomfortable intersection because these two forces are often uh, pulling you in different directions, if not always opposite directions. Um, so uh, to your point, um, what, what we do internationally has to be connected to what we are doing, what we are talking about, what our objectives and our challenges are at home. And I'll use that then to segue to your question about the WTO, which is the, um, the public narrative is, and I, I, this is my opportunity to uh, explain and try not to get too wonky, although this is a wonky crowd, um, <clears throat> that uh, what we did this fall at the WTO was not to reverse a position, was not to change a position, but to withdraw our attributions, which is a, you know, WTO negotiation speak for, um, withdraw our uh, indicated support for um, three or four uh, proposals in the ongoing WTO negotiations um, on an e-commerce agreement. Um, it's not a full WTO negotiation, so it's not the full 164 membership that's participating. It's a subset of about 90, a significant portion of the WTO. And uh, what we did was to take a look at uh, what our positions are and to um, assess whether or not they still align with the domestic debate, domestic conversation, the domestic uh, regulatory environment uh, for these issues. And because it is e-commerce, um, it is really um, a negotiation over the digital economy which at this point is so much of the economy. Uh, everything that we do uh, in the economy now touches on uh, technology and data. So as we were looking, we thought, yes, 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 for most of the proposals, we are still where uh, we have been. And a couple of those proposals, ones that deal really specifically with data, data flows, mm -hmm data storage, data localization, we call it, and also on source code. And these three areas, what 
uh, I saw was that the debate that we are having here at home, the conversation around uh, technology and technological advancement and data and the regulation of the digital economy has shifted significantly since we put those proposals forward in 2019. And as a result, we needed to withdraw our attributions to create the space for us to come up with new positions and a new orientation for engaging with the other 90 countries that are negotiating this. Just so that I think I can understand that, is that a matter of domestic questions about possible regulation in this area, because there's talk about that certainly in Congress, or is it a question of international dealings, particularly I'll name it China, which has its own positions on some of those things you're talking about, data flow across and the location of, of data. Uh, or is it a combination of the two? I think that there are um, two aspects of it. So um, let me take the first one in terms of, uh, again, that connection between what we're doing internationally in terms of trade and economic relations and negotiations and um, what is going on here at home. Um, We've had the internet, I actually remember, it was my senior year of college that uh, the summer between junior and senior years, I'm gonna date myself, but I'm not shy, <laughs> um, uh, that the, the World Wide Web was really rolled out for the world. And I remember coming back and going through a training where the question was, where do you put your mouse? Would you, you, put, you, you pass your mouse over text, and if it's highlighted, that means you can click on it. So that's in my lifetime. That was my senior year of college, right? So a lot has changed in a short amount of time. Uh, we here in the United States don't have a very robust, and this is an understatement, we don't have a very robust regulatory system for uh, the technology and economy environment. We're struggling with that every day because in the last almost 30 years, I haven't been out of college for quite 30 years yet, in the last almost 30 years, so much has changed. And the rules that we put in place and the fact that we don't have rules for a lot of this is starting to um, come home to roost, like, like the, the famous chickens, right? We're starting to realize that the implications of a regulatory system that um, uh, started in the 90s and hasn't evolved very far is creating disconnects with uh, the, the implications of this technology advancement. So I'll give you one very, very specific example that I think may resonate with a lot of people because it's a large part of the conversation in so many ways. Um, the unveiling of ChatGPT4 in the spring, I think was a wake up moment for all of us that wow, there is a lot of innovation that's going on in our economy. That is a great thing, but holy Jesus, <clears throat> uh, what is happening here? And I would just say that even, a, um, even five years ago, um, I had the opportunity to participate in a conference at Stanford where they did a whole AI presentation for us. And at the time, the prompts that you were giving AI were coming out with hilariously funny outcomes. When you ask AI that was being trained to write a joke, and uh, the joke that came out the back end was almost never funny, or it was funny because it was so unfunny, right? So at the time, I think just five years ago, 2019, 2018, we're thinking, wow, this uh, could have a lot of potential. There's so much innovation. There's so much uh, stuff that's brewing. Um, but we don't have to be worried about it yet because it's still very rudimentary. Short period of time, all of a sudden, for all of you who have experimented with ChatGPT4 and you started putting prompts in, literally blowing everybody's minds, right? Which is the focus that we have now on AI. What is AI built on? <clears throat> it's built on massive amounts of data. we are come back to the issue of data. Mm -hmm. How do you develop AI? You have to have access not just to those massive amounts of data, you have to have access to incredibly powerful uh, computing processes. You marry those two up and you're going to push that innovation and push that development. Who has access to that kind of data and that kind of computing power? A very small number of extremely powerful and dominant companies that are almost all, if not all, American. And that's why our posture on the rules that apply to data flows, data localization, and source code is so important. At the core of each of these proposals in these negotiations is um, the question that we have to answer around the balance of authority between the private sector and the companies and the government and our regulatory authorities. Who gets to decide 
or control how freely the data can flow and when it can be restricted, where it needs to be stored, and when access is required to disclose source code. Uh, and I think that those issues are very much consequential, not just for trade and economics, but for our entire society. And the cross-cutting nature of these issues means that if we're going to lead using trade rules at a time when there is no consensus but massive amounts of debate and questioning, then I, as USTR, am committing massive malpractice and uh, probably committing uh, policy suicide by getting out ahead of all of the other conversations and decisions that we need to make as a country. You don't want to be too far behind. You also can't be too far ahead. You want to make sure that you get the balance right. Uh, you said almost all. One place that has an awful lot of data is China, and they're developing computer ability very fast. Uh, some people propose, including in foreign affairs, that we should be having arms control negotiations with the U.S. and China right now over generative AI. Does that make sense to you? Is that something being considered by the U.S. government? So I say that I'm on the foreign policy team, which I am. Uh, on the national security issues, I'll just say that, um, you know, if you think of it as a band, um, and Secretary <laughs> Austin, Secretary Blinken are like the, the, the lead singer and the lead bassist, right? Um, uh, USDR, I'm kind of a backup singer or maybe a backup dancer. Like, we are absolutely a part of the team, but I'm not driving that, I, and I don't think I should be driving that national security piece. As USTR, um, this is very much true today, and I think that past USTRs haven't had to say it because um, our uh, domestic situation was different and the global geopolitical uh, situation was different, but um, I spend so much of my time thinking about democracy. Democracy, we are a political democracy, but I, I, I as USTR, spend a lot of my time thinking about how we can democratize economic opportunity here at home in America, mm -hmm. and how we can do that with our partners so that they can do the same thing at home. And I think that that's a really important part in terms of USTR and uh, treating data as a, a national security um, a controlled substance. Um, I understand why that um, <clears throat> has relevance, but I think that we also have to understand the criticality of data to just our, our regular economic vibrancy. Moving beyond data, you've taken us, I think, to a version of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, something that President Biden went to Asia and really touted, something that if you're not the lead singer, you're pretty close to the lead singer on. Um, give us a sense of where that stands right now. I think there were some expectations at APEC that we'd make some real progress. Some people were disappointed and didn't feel like we did. Is that an accurate perception? And if so, why didn't we make the progress? So um, is it an accurate, uh, like I, some people dis, did express disappointment, but let me, let me say uh, what we did. Um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is the Biden administration's uh, economic engagement framework and a program for uh, our partnership with um, our friends in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it has four pillars. Um, and we're very much applying lessons that we've learned from the past seven or eight years. So first, um, trade is a pillar, uh, but it is not the only pillar. In addition to trade, uh, we also had a pillar on, uh, have a pillar on supply chains, one on decarb and infrastructure, uh, climate financing, that kind of thing, and the last one on um, uh, specifically it's tax and anti-corruption, but I, I like to think of it as good governance. When you take them all together, we feel that this is a more comprehensive economic engagement than just, just a trade negotiation, right? It's also designed to be responsive to the challenges that all of us, all 14 countries in the Indo-Pacific framework are uh, grappling with today. And those are economically with respect to our resilience, with respect to our sustainability, and with respect to the inclusivity of the economic outcomes that we are having at home and uh, together. So uh, each one of those pieces. Now, on trade, let me drill down a little bit more there. Um, within the trade pillar, we've made very, very clear. This is not a traditional free trade agreement. This is not the TPP. There are things that we did in the TPP that we are not doing in the trade pillar. For example, tariff negotiations. We're not doing them, largely because right now, in terms of um, uh, aggressive tariff liberalization, it is my view that um, <clears throat> we can't 
we don't have a program for doing a tariff program right now that will serve the purpose of resilience and more resilient supply chains. So we're not doing that. But everything that we have scoped into pillar one, the trade pillar, has had to answer yes to one or more of the following questions. Does this topic and issue area, does this suite of rules promote more resilience, more sustainability, or more inclusivity? And so um, uh, we have been working very hard. There are about um, 10 different issue areas within the trade pillar. Uh, we've made significant progress um, to uh, achieving consensus in about uh, five and a half of them. Uh, regardless of what we were planning to do or celebrate at APEC in uh, November of this year, we uh, had a very full 2024 negotiation agenda. We will continue with that. We are committed to continuing with it. And we have partners who have told us that they are excited and committed to continue negotiating with us through next year. Uh, Madam Ambassador, you said we live in a democracy. And part of democracy is, is politics, as it should be. Indeed. That's the way we decide things in yes. this country. Uh, we happen to have an election year coming up. Uh, next year. Is it realistic to expect real progress in the Indo-Pacific economic framework in an election year? Because there are real domestic political consequences. Um, I'd say this, that uh, the lessons that we've learned from the past, uh, let's say, seven years on trade mean that uh, we can't ever ignore the domestic political consequences of what we're doing in trade. So um, in terms of looking at next year, it will be a particularly um, uh, uh, political year. Uh, but the issue of trade um, is inherently political. To your point, uh, when you are a part of the domestic economic policy team, uh, how what you do impacts ordinary Americans at their kitchen table is always relevant. And so I think uh, from my perspective, uh, next year uh, for us, we will be sensitive to um, uh, the scale, uh, but not the nature of the year. Uh, and I think that for everything that we are doing, uh, we stand 100% behind the responsibility that we have brought to how we've scoped and designed the negotiations. Uh, let's talk about how you uh, invest your capital, if I can put it that way. You're responsible for trade agreements. And it strikes me that there are at least three categories of that. New trade agreements, mm. expanding current trade agreements, or enforcing existing trade mm. agreements. How do you allocate your time and resources among those three? So, um, uh, well, uh, this is how you do it. <laughs> um, you spend 100% of your time negotiating. You spend 100% of your time enforcing. You spend 100% of your time expanding. OK, I right? walked into that one. Yeah, right, OK. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'll take it as a, as a segue to talking about um, our enforcement agenda. Uh, we, um, uh, we do a lot of things, right? Um, we're responsible for trade policy, and you have to think about that very broadly. Um, in terms of trade enforcement, uh, in order for our trade agreements and our trade arrangements to have integrity, um, we have to hold our partners accountable for the promises that they have made to us and to our stakeholders and to their stakeholders too. Uh, so um, we take the enforcement agenda extremely seriously. It is a very high priority. Um, a couple uh, aspects of this I want to highlight. Uh, one is with respect to the USMCA, which is mm -hmm. the um, renewed NAFTA. Now that renegotiation uh, caught a lot of headlines while it was being renegotiated. Um, and uh, it's really a, a very, very interesting um, uh, articulation of um, the basis for uh, a modern new um, U.S. trade policy. Um, one of the most important aspects of the USMCA in terms of uh, what it does that the NAFTA didn't do, it has um, much stronger labor and environmental standards. Mm -hmm. It has stronger enforcement mechanisms, and it has in particular a labor-specific enforcement mechanism that we call the rapid response mechanism for short. This is a mechanism that allows the United States and Mexico to uh, work together to reach and pierce the veil of state-to-state -state interaction to focus on specific facilities within Mexico that are not respecting Mexico's laws on labor justice or the USMCA's rules. 
And uh, we have activated this, um, uh, this mechanism, I think the current count is 16 times, 14 times at the behest of petitioners, twice on our own initiative. And in every one of those cases that we have seen through to the end, we have won uh, rights, we have won uh, uh, real benefits for workers in Mexico. Why this matters, uh, democracy and the democratization of economic opportunity. Uh, when Mexican workers have the ability, as they should under their own law, to advocate for themselves for better working conditions and higher wages, we are evening the playing field for American workers. And I think it is not an accident that right now about 90% of the cases that we have brought have been in the auto sector. And I'll give you one specific example. Uh, early on in the first year, it was um, the, the first, one of the first three cases that we brought was uh, related to a GM facility in Silao, Mexico. As a result of our work on that, in partnership with the Mexican government, uh, the workers at that facility were able to win a new vote for a union. They voted in a truly independent union to represent them. They voted on a collective bargaining agreement that that union negotiated for them that they saw before they voted to approve it. And they won better benefits. They won the first wage increase that they had had in years. It was a 10% wage increase. And in the second year, that went up another 10%. These are real wins, but the most significant part of this, which um, I want more people to know about, is what we are doing in the USMCA is relevant to everybody who is interested in trade because we have flipped the narrative, the strong criticism of US trade policy on its head. For the first time ever, we are offering workers a mechanism for their own advocacy and empowerment through a trade agreement. Without this trade agreement, they wouldn't have this mechanism. And I think that this is one of the cornerstones of what we call the, uh, the worker-centered trade policy, which is to drive a trade policy that more Americans feel like is going to champion their interests. On the other hand, we're also doing a lot for our farmers, as we always have. And within the USMCA context, without leaving that agreement, I'll say that um, uh, we've taken very seriously uh, our corn producers' concerns around the uh, Mexican decree uh, that will impact uh, our trading relationship. And uh, we um, initiated um, a dispute settlement case in the middle of this year, and we are litigating it out right now. Uh, on the subject of expanding existing agreements, uh, we had, I believe it's your counterpart in Taiwan this week, say, we'd like to have a free trade agreement. Let's expand out what we have right now. Obviously, that would raise geopolitical issues, foreign policy issues. Uh, are you open to that? So the negotiation we're having with Taiwan right now, and I'll just highlight here, um, every trade negotiation we're doing right now um, has an element of innovation that's baked into it. Mm -hmm. And this is because we're trying to be responsive to the data and the feedback that we are receiving from the world economy. There are so many changes that are going on simultaneously that I have not met even our smartest economists. Um, even my colleague Janet Yellen, who is a legend in macroeconomics, no one can explain exactly what's happening or predict exactly what's going to happen next. And so from a trade policy perspective, what we have been very disciplined in trying to do is to say, let us bring a trade uh, program to each one of our partners mm -hmm. that's tailored to that partner, that's tailored to their interest and our interest in the partnership, that's also tailored to the challenges and the dynamics that we are um, navigating together in the global economy. With Taiwan, what that's meant is that we have been negotiating uh, agreements, uh, and um, the first agreement that's, um, uh, that we have with Taiwan is one that covers, I think, um, five issue areas. Um, it's uh, trade facilitation, it's small medium enterprises, good regulatory practices, um, and um, uh, oh, I'll have to look at my notes for the other two, but we've got a core group of uh, five disciplines. Uh, we signed that agreement. Um, Congress, uh, in a fit of um, enthusiasm, even though they weren't legally required to, uh, took a vote on it uh, to show their support for what we are doing here. And on the basis of that support, we are negotiating another set of disciplines uh, right as we speak. We've been making excellent progress, and we will continue to look at building out uh, those agreements to, to have an arrangement with 
the Taiwan economy that is fit for the times. And the times are very challenging. And so this is one of our accomplishments that we are particularly proud of and committed to. So you don't rule out a free trade agreement, but it's not now. Look, so let me let me back up to um, what, what, what do you mean by a free trade agreement, <laughs> right? Do you mean the traditional kind of US approach to a uh, very, very comprehensive, maximally liberalizing, aggressively liberalizing agreement? We're not doing that with anybody right now. Um, it's actually insensitive to the dynamics in the global economy and the U.S. economy right now to push on with that program, which may have been fit for the 80s and the 90s. Maybe it was starting to show its age in the 2000s and 2010s. It's 2023. We need new policies. There's innovation going on all around us. When we were negotiating those agreements, um, I don't know, AI wasn't even a thing that we talked about, right? So in, in all these different ways, but certainly we hadn't experienced the pandemic, supply chain discombobulations and disconnect the fragilities, the geopolitical tensions where we've always had them, but they were different and at a different scale with different partners. So in all ways, uh, as much as we embrace innovation instinctively as Americans and certainly in our economy, um, we need to be embracing innovation in our trade policy and that's what we're doing. And that's why when you say FTA, sure, if by FTA you mean are we innovating trade agreements and are we doing trade um, uh, aggressively but in new ways? Yes. When you say FTA, if you mean the old style trade agreements that we used to do, then no. Uh, we have to talk about climate. Uh, it's been a priority of President Biden from the beginning of the Biden administration. You said that trade does have a role in that in climate. We've just been experiencing COP28. Uh, what specifically can you do in trade with respect to that? Let me be more pointed than that. Why don't we have a carbon adjustment tax? Mm -hmm. That's something that we've heard favorable things, even from President Biden, about. Yeah. Yeah. Democrats had a proposal, didn't go forward. Yeah. Why don't we just do that? Okay, so um, first, uh, trade has to be part of the solution. Uh, why aren't we there yet? And I would say, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> that question needs to go to the US Congress. Tax policy, who writes the tax policy? It's not that we have no role, don't get me wrong, not, but we each have our respective roles as prescribed by our founding document, which is the US Constitution. With respect to tax policy, that is absolutely the jurisdiction of the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have to have that congressional legislative revenue outlook and consensus, or at least a basis, before I can do anything appreciably meaningful in trade. That is true for climate. It is also true for digital. Congress gets to decide ultimately. Is the Biden administration pressing actively for a carbon adjustment tax? Are we pressing aggressively for a carbon adjustment tax? I mean, it's been tax? known to happen that the White House proposes things to Congress yes. to get them to enact it. Well, you should, you should if, if John Podesta is still in the building, you should ask him to come back and ask, <laughs> right. ask him get, that question. Let back. me go back to your original question, which is, uh, what are we doing with respect to trade yeah. and climate? Uh, the most important thing that we have been doing, another of our innovative uh, trade initiatives has been uh, the negotiation of a global steel and aluminum arrangement with Europe. So um, we have had Section 232 global tariffs on our steel and aluminum imports. Uh, the Biden administration's perspective is um, with respect to global overcapacity and uh, global market distortions in uh, steel and aluminum, that is a fact that we have to contend with. We have to be able to be a steel producer uh, in the global economy, including for national security reasons, but also for basic economic reasons. Um, but we shouldn't be taking that on alone. The distortions that are happening in the global marketplace are, are happening to our partners too. So we join forces with the Europeans to say, Let's figure out how we can liberalize and normalize trade between us on steel and aluminum, but work together to defend our economies against unfair trade and unfair production and create incentives for cleaner trade and cleaner production. It also is helpful that the Europeans have put forward and are rolling out a carbon border adjustment mechanism that covers five or six sectors, very carbon intensive industrial sectors that include steel and aluminum. That is what we've been working towards. We gave ourselves two years. We realized this fall that we're going to need more time. And we are committed in the Biden administration on behalf of the United States to staying at the table and working on this issue with Europe because it is so important. And it is foundationally important to creating a template for 
what we might do more broadly. We have time for one more question, and I want to be, have it be about Africa. Yep. It's something that's important overall, and I know it's important to you. Yes. Where are we right now with Africa and trade? So um, I think that next week will be the one-year anniversary of the um, uh, President Biden's um, uh, uh, African Leaders Summit, which we uh, hosted last year in December. Uh, at the conclusion of that summit, uh, President Biden gave an instruction to all of us in his administration, which is uh, build partnerships with Africa, with the continent, with the countries, with the regions. Mm -hmm. And each one of us was encouraged to go to Africa early, often. I've been to the continent twice this year. Uh, one trip in July was to Kenya. We are negotiating another one of our innovative trade arrangements with Kenya. Uh, the other one was last month uh, to Johannesburg uh, when South Africa hosted the AGOA Forum. The AGOA Forum is the trade program that we have with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. These um, uh, engagements and uh, these exercises that I've been involved in are to pursue an enhanced, robust, uh, new approach to a U.S.-Africa economic partnership that uh, helps us harness and develop the potential of Africa to be the economic engine that drives growth in this next period of globalization. But in order to do that, we're going to need to figure out how to do it differently. We're going to need development models that are more effective and more successful for both sides of the equation. And I'm very, very excited by what we're doing. Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. Really great to have you here. That's Catherine Tai, U.S. Trade Representative. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do something unprecedented for the Aspen Security Forum. We're going to give you a break. <laughs> so please, there's lunch served outside. Please help yourselves. We have an hour for lunch. Please come back here on time because we have a jam-packed, fascinating afternoon.